We've uh, flown in from San Francisco earlier this week, um, and the reason is to show you some of the things that we've been working on. Um, but before we get too deep into the nitty gritty, I think there's a lot of people here who have maybe never heard of Interledger, or at least don't know uh, too much about the context in which, which it exists, as well as what sort of the high level architecture is and the, the, you know, the general principles that guide its development. Um, and so before we, again, go too deep into the weeds, I want to give you a little bit of an overview. Um, so first of all, the problem that we're trying to solve is that payments are really lagging behind technical development. So if you think of the internet, I can send a message to anyone in the world from my device all the way to theirs um, pretty much instantly, pretty much to anyone. Even um, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa, people have phones um, that can receive my, my messages, but I can't send money with those messages. And so there's this huge lag between um, how I can send information, how I can send money. And that's funny because money is just information. Money is just entries in the database somewhere. Um, and so we looked at this problem um, from a number of different angles. And what it really seems to boil down to is that the current infrastructure uh, on a global level has been designed for very large payments, um, or a small number of them, um, maybe batch payments, you know, large corporate payments, those sorts of things. And it's never really been intended for um, these sort of high volume, uh, low value payments that I'm thinking of as a consumer when I want to make a, a transfer internationally. And, you know, the system has really been evolving at a different time. You know, it's not been evolving in the world of Uber and, and Airbnb and um, the sharing economy where, you know, thousands of providers are providing services and thousands of customers are buying the services all over the world. And there isn't really that a correlation between the two. Like, you know, we're using Uber all the time here, and so we have to pay some company, and then that company has to figure out how to disperse it to all the Uber drivers um, in, in different countries and so on. So um, that's a very different thing. Um, there is uh, the Internet of Things that's becoming bigger and bigger, so more and more you'll see devices paying each other, more and more you'll see web services paying each other. And so all of these demands are, are you know, being put on this, um, this old system. And so one of the things you might ask yourself, like, where's the competition? Why isn't there, you know, a bunch of new systems are springing up, people are doing a better job, um, you know, faster alternatives, faster options. And of course, the answer is that they are, they are out there. You know, there's, there's lots of companies that are building, you know, payment solutions of different kinds. Um, but you'll notice if you look at this list, and this is a, um, a series of, of uh, payment methods that's accepted just by one website, right? So this one um, online shop, Primnetta, accepts all these different payment methods. And you can immediately sort of put them into two categories where there's sort of the global ones like Visa and, and MasterCard and Discover. Um, and then there's all these small local ones like GeoPay is very big in Germany, Ideal is very big in the Netherlands. Um, and you can probably, you know, depending on where you come from, pick out the ones that, that you know in your local area. And so the reason for why you have sort of these few global ones that, you know, don't have maybe the, the fee structure you need for maybe micropayments or maybe don't have the APIs for automated payments and so on, um, and then you have these other ones that maybe have all these nice features and all these nice APIs, but they only have local reach. The reason for that is because global reach is very expensive. And so as a consequence, it becomes a sort of oligopoly where very few providers, very few companies can provide that global reach. And that's true both for consumer type services where you think you know, of like card networks like Visa and MasterCard, but it's also true for um, sort of the banking world where you have a few large global correspondent banks um, and, you know, no, no one really competing with them on, on the same level. And so the question is, like, can we, can we address this problem somehow? And in order to do so, we have to kind of take a step back and, and really understand what payments are and, and where they come from and what are the tools that we have available. And with Interledger, we kind of try to come from first principles. And so I want to first start with some definitions. Um, so the first definition is, what's a, uh, is, a, is that of a ledger. Um, a ledger is basically something that you can use to record transactions, um, and that lets you keep track of how much money different people have. Um, and we're using that now in the digital world where um, we need to keep track of the money that you're spending because data can be copied, so you can't really have cash uh, in a digital world. You have to have some kind of ledger that records transactions so people can't send the same data to different people multiple times um, and kind of duplicate it that way. Um, and so ledgers are you know, thousands of years old, have been used for all kinds of different reasons, um, and today they're used for electronic payments. And so if you have a sender and a receiver, they both have to be connected to the same ledger, and then you can make a transfer. Um, and the transfer is just recorded in a ledger, the balances are updated, um, and the ledger also enforces certain rules, like you probably can go infinitely negative on, on most ledgers. 
Um, another way of looking at the same picture is, is you kind of have the ledger in the middle and then everyone's sort of connected to it. Um, and again, that's been the same for, for thousands of years until very recently when we started to see this model where you have these distributed ledgers. And so now everyone has a copy of the ledger and it isn't the central operator anymore. And I would highlight this as like a pretty big shift in how ledgers work compared to how they used to work. Um, and also like, you know, this is probably going to exist um, next to the old model, right? There's probably going to continue to be central ledgers. There's going to be distributed ledgers. There probably won't be just one distributed ledger um, for all kinds of reasons, um, mostly because you're making so many um, technical choices. You know, as someone who's worked both on uh, Bitcoin for a while as well as on Ripple, um, these are both distributed ledgers. And in both cases, there are so many trade-offs that you have to make and so many features that you have to decide on. Um, and if you're building a ledger that's optimized for stock transactions, it might be a very different ledger than one that's you know, optimized for drug transactions. You know? So like, depending on what you're building your ledger for, you're going to optimize it for very different things. And so it's, we believe it's, it's very unlikely that the world will eventually agree on just one system to use for everything, right? Um, and for a long time, we've been kind of out there in, at, at conferences going like, you know, you should just use Ripple for all of your different assets. Uh, but they, at the end of the day, you know, people are like, well, but I want this feature, I want that feature, I want it to be faster, I want it to be more decentralized or less decentralized, I want it to be lower latency or uh, more anonymous or this and that. And so we just don't think that there's going to be one ledger to rule them all. And so what are we left with? Um, we think that this diversity is actually a good thing. You know, you have these different uh, use cases and you have different ledgers that serve them better. Um, that's a good thing. We don't want to get rid of that. And in a way, that that's a, a more fundamental kind of decentralization than even a distributed ledger can give you. Because, yeah, Bitcoin is decentralized, but then there's still sort of a group of people that has to sort of agree on what the rules are um, for it to work. Um, because it is just one ledger, and so there has to be agreement. Um, if we want true decentralization, there can't just be one system, even if that system is a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, and so we still have this problem of why are these systems dis disconnected? How do we make sure that, that we can still transact even though we have this diversity and even though there's these very different systems out there? In order to understand that, we have to kind of think about, okay, um, if we assume that we're not in the same system, if we assume that we're going to be on different ledgers because there isn't just one, then um, what do we know about that? Well, we know that there have to be local transfers happening on both of those ledgers, right? So we know that on the sending side, um, the sender is going to transfer money out of her account to somebody. Um, and on the receiving side, somebody is going to be transferring money to the receiver. And so again, this is all just going, coming from first principles, trying to figure out what does an interledger transfer actually look like? And so the simplest way to kind of put these two things together is just to say, well, there's somebody who has accounts on both ledgers and now they can, they can make that connection and they can provide the other side of those transfers. And um, why are they doing that? You know, we'll, we'll put that to the side for now. Um, you know, are these the same currency, different currencies? We're going to assume it's the same for now. Um, so we're going to make a lot of assumptions here. Um, but ultimately, there has to be some system that understands both ledgers and, and can connect both ledgers. Otherwise, um, you just can't have a cross-ledger transfer. Now, one of the problems with this model is that, OK, now we have a way to connect any two ledgers, right? So we could just have a connector. Um, and whatever ledger you're on, whatever ledger I'm on, there's a connector that connects the two. The problem is that just from basic math, it just does not scale. So as soon as we add a few more ledgers, we already have um, you know, a bunch more connections. So to connect two ledgers, we just need one bilateral connection. But if we want to connect four ledgers, we already need six. Um, and so that number of connections, is it six? It's five, six, yeah, six, right? OK. <laughs> Um, but um, but it, th this goes up quadratically, right? The formula is n times n minus 1 divided by 2. Um, and so um, that goes up pretty quick. Um, so with, um, I don't know how many ledgers these are, I think it's 12. Um, with just 12 ledgers, you already have like a pretty unreasonable number of bilateral connections. Um, and so, you know, that's a problem. But fortunately, it's a problem that, that we know the solution to, which is um, this concept of a network. So you have the same thing, you have a graph but you just don't assume that everything has to be fully connected. You just assume that there's some connections and some connections are miss missing and that's totally fine. Um, and so once we go up to 12 nodes with this model, this is a much more reasonable number of connections. Um, and so we know a lot of networks, uh, social networks, we know uh, the internet, um, and those are all, all very large scale networks that are still uh, fully connected. Um, and so, sorry, not fully connected, but like uh, they are connected in, um, from every node to every node, which they might be fully connected, whatever. Um, so, 
now the problem is now that we don't now we don't have a direct connection, however, right? So like these things might be connected somehow, but we no longer have this obvious connector that is exactly from the ledger that I'm on exactly to the ledger that I'm trying to go to. Um, and so, in in lieu of that, we have to find some other path that we can go through. Um, and this is starting to um, kind of raise all the questions that IntelliJ is trying to answer, which is, um, well, how do we talk about that destination? How do we all recognize where we're trying to get to? How do we do that routing? Um, how do we make sure that the right amount gets there? Um, and so what was pretty trivial with just one connector that understood both ledgers is now sort of this um, problem that is involving a lot of different parties. And that's where it gets really interesting. So how do we do this? And uh, in order to do that, we first have to go to the workshop. We have to put our thinking caps on. And um, one of the things that's always good when, when you're an engineer is like try to learn from history because uh, history tends to repeat itself and um, people have probably, probably smarter people than you have pro solved a very similar problem in the past. And so we looked at the, the example of networks. Um, you know, specifically, I started my presentation by saying information works really well. Well, maybe we can just copy what, what people are doing for information and apply it to payments, you know? Um, and so networks used to be in a very similar situation that, that payment networks are today, where you had sort of different online service providers like AOL, CompuServe. If you were on their network, you could interact with anyone else on that same network, but they were fundamentally disconnected. And so um, they were competing over reach. Um, so if you're um, AOL, you're basically advertising, we have the most users. You can email the most users if you come on our platform. Uh, you can use the most services um, to businesses they would advertise. You can reach the most customers if you come to, to our platform. And so um, you get that exact kind of dynamic that you get with like Visa and MasterCard where um, the largest guys um, have value just because they're large, just because they have these network effects. Um, and so that's very different compared to um, what we have in the internet today where um, there's sort of this network of networks. And so it doesn't matter if you're a large ISP or a small ISP, you can reach the same websites, right? And now suddenly it becomes about um, the efficiency of how well do you forward packets? How many packets do you lose? How long do packets take to transition your network? Um, and so their competition changes a lot. And that's, we think, where the efficiency comes from is that you're no longer talking about um, you know, just trying to build the biggest possible network at any cost, but rather um, being small and nimble and figuring out the most efficient way to, to route a certain payment. Um, now, this is all very abstract, so let's see if we can make this a little bit more practical. So the internet protocol really revolves around these two features. Uh, the one that I'm gonna focus on right now is, is the addressing feature, and you'll see that come up a lot in our presentations today. Um, so you've probably seen something like this um, and probably heard the term IP address. Um, that's basically the fundamental um, standard within the internet protocol is like we agree on this way of addressing networks or specifically addressing hosts. And so if I give you this address, you know exactly which host I'm talking about globally, right? So you know exactly where to get to. And the internet protocol, interestingly, does not address exactly how you're getting there. Um, it just says like, well, you, put a, you, you create a packet, you put this um, header on top, you say like, okay, I want to, want to get here, and then you send it off, and then someone else is gonna figure out how to actually get it there. And what that does is it abstracts the complexities of routing, which are pretty substantial, away from the sort of global standard everyone has to support. And as a result, you can have an IP stack on your phone, despite the fact that you know, your phone would never be capable of running like a, a full-scale internet tier one router, right? Because that's a very um, heavy, um, heavy task. Um, and it also makes it so that over time you have a lot of abstraction. So um, you don't have to upgrade your phone every time uh, someone comes up with a better routing algorithm. Only these larger routers have to upgrade. And so that gives you that, that kind of flexibility and that, that um, simplicity that you need for a global protocol. Um, and the way that this actually is implemented in practice is by having these, this layered architecture. Um, and this is again from one of the internet RFCs basically showing that there is this one common layer, so people sometimes call this the hourglass architecture, because they have this one common layer, which is the internet protocol. Um, and then below that, you have all the different ways that you could transmit information, all the different ways that you could operate a network um, via Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, satellite, ethernet. Um, and all of these could be internet enabled just by um, creating the right plugin. Um, on top of the internet protocol, you have so-called so transport protocols. Um, they're basically dealing with reliable transmissions. So 
Um, UDP is sort of the, the most basic one where you just don't care, you, you kind of send it off and you hope it gets there. Um, and then with TCP, you have a little bit more control. And you, it guarantees that your packet's gonna arrive in order, it's gonna retry if a packet doesn't get there and so on. And then on top of that, all of the hard problems are solved. So you can basically, on top of that, you can assume that once you have an IP address and once you have a port number, um, you can just make a connection and start sending messages back and forth. And so you can build these, these relatively simple protocols that don't have to worry about all the details of networking and routing and so on. So it creates this just very nice set of abstractions. And so IntelliJ is an attempt to do the same thing. And I don't know if it's a very good attempt, but it's our attempt. And um, here's what it looks like. So um, we have very similarly sort of this minimal layer in the middle, which is just Internet Protocol. Sorry, the Interledger protocol, um, and that all that specifies is basically a way to address, and I'll, I'll show you the details on that in a minute, um, as well as talk about amounts. And then below that, you have um, the network layer, which could be any type of uh, system that's capable of value transfer, right? Um, so you can imagine building this into a banking system, like we're doing at Ripple. Um, you could imagine building this into cryptocurrency uh, ledgers. Um, Etc. And a lot of uh, cryptocurrency ledgers actually already support the features that you need fundamentally. So uh, maybe we'll get to talk about that more at the hackathon. Um, and then finally, once you have this sort of ILP layer, then you can start to build different application layers uh, on top of that. So um, we are already work thinking about um, uh, two of those. One is, um, we call it the simple payment setup protocol. So it's basically the HTTP of the Interledger. It could end up being the gopher of, Inter of Interledger if no one ends up using it, but um, it's basically a very simple sort of setup protocol for talking about a payment. Um, I want this receiver, let's resolve this address into an Interledger address, um, and then send money to them. Um, the passive uh, payment setup protocol, which is the second example here, um, that's a protocol where we're basically skipping that setup step and basically using some um, more fancy cryptography to um, avoid some round trips. And so there could be many, many, many more protocols. And in fact, at Ripple, for instance, we're developing a proprietary one um, and so on. So anyone can build their own application layer protocol depending on the use case that they're trying to do. But the nice thing is that because it's sharing this interledger layer, um, it shares all the routing uh, algorithms. So anyone that, that improves the routing algorithms for the interledger protocol uh, will be able to um, uh, improve every application that's on top of that. If someone makes a new uh, plugin for a new ledger, that will improve all the applications because they can now talk to this new ledger. Um, you know, we've been working on uh, a smart contracts platform a few years ago called Codius, and one of the biggest problems was that you had to support all these different networks, and it was a big hassle, right? You can't assume that everyone has all their assets on one ledger, and so you basically have to support all of them. Um, and at some point, it just becomes intractable if you, have, if you have every contract supporting every ledger. And so ILP just gives you this very nice abstraction layer between um, the way that money actually moves and all the things you, you might want to do that, that moves money. Um, so here's sort of a very quick, um, you know, what does Interledger actually look like? Um, so the two things we have to define if we want to do an Interledger transaction is we have to define where, where it should go and how much we want to send. Um, and so the where is some kind of address, and we'll talk about that in more detail in the next section. Um, and then we have to kind of provide an amount, like how much are we trying to send? Um, and so we have to define formats for those. So that's, that's really the core of Interledger. Um, the other thing is like we want to add a little bit of security. We don't want to just sort of shoot it off and hope for the best. Um, we want to make sure that, that people can't steal that money on, in transit. In order to be able to do that, we have to add two more things, which is when do we have to get it there by? Um, and the reason for that is that if someone just gets the money and doesn't forward it and just waits forever, we want there to be some kind of timeout. So we say, when is this going to happen? Um, otherwise, we want to timeout. And then um, the other thing we need to make sure is that um, why are we sending this money and like specifically what are we trying to accomplish? Like what is this money for? Um, and that is, is what we call the condition. So um, we only want to pay people that we're asking to forward payments for us if they actually manage to forward them. And how do we know that they manage to forward them? Well, because they, they've provided that proof, that definition that we gave for why are we paying. So again, it might be a little bit too much to, to take in all at once, but uh, you'll see this reappear, so don't worry if, you don't, if you're not getting it now. Um, but basically, we are setting an expiry to address the when, and then we're setting this, what we call a crypto condition for um, addressing the, the what, what is this for. And um, we'll do questions afterwards. Um, and so with these four fields, that gives you basically everything that you need to know about a payment in order to forward it into a, a different net network. Um, and so that gives us the ability to support longer chains, and longer chains is the, longer chains is just the different way of saying that we now support networks. 
And so now we can basically um, think of all the ledgers out there as nodes waiting to be connected. Right? We can think of all the different payment methods, all the different wallets, all the different um, cryptocurrencies and bank accounts and uh, mobile money wallets and everything as different things that are eventually going to come together um, and you can connect them together using this protocol. Um, and we'll talk again a little bit more about uh, how to do that again later today. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to my colleague Evan who's gonna show you some of this stuff in action. Um, and this is where it gets really exciting. Thank you.